All right. Uh, looks like uh, it's the time. Um, so uh, thanks every, everybody for coming to our department's seminar. And today we are very glad to have Zhang Yang as our speaker. And Zhang Yang is an anomalous of our department and he has over 20 years of industry experience in GIS, asset and facility management. And uh, as the director of geospatial Serv uh, services for Patrick Engineering, he is dedicated to growing a team of GIS and asset management professionals. And this team also provides solutions and uh, services to help clients improve their management of gas, electric utilities, telecommunications, transportation, and building facility assets. So uh, without any further ado, I will leave the time to John for his talk. So let's give him a big applause for his talk. <laughs> All right, and the crowd went wild. Awesome. Now, <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, you know, look, I mean, we're in, uh, I like to think we're in good company here. Um, it's a pleasure to, you know, to, to join you guys today. I, um, you know, I kind of go back to what is it, the late 80s? 90s and then into the mid 90s, uh, you know, in my time at, at App, both during undergrad and after I came back from grad school, just over the hill in, in Tennessee. So it's uh, it's great to join you today. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've kind of got a, a bit of an action packed uh, layout here. Um, I kind of plan for like an hour, but, you know, we'll, I'm going to try to cram it into about 50 minutes. And then we can do some Q and A because I think you guys like to save save time for that. So let me go ahead and just jump right into it. Um, tends to be the way I do things. So let me. You guys can see the screen. Um, not not yet. Oh well, I guess I should probably hit that. Yeah, button. yeah. Are we good? Yeah. Now we now we can see. Awesome. All right. So I um. I thought I would uh, title this um, the, the way I honestly just feel about the situation these days and how all my colleagues feel, um, because I'll tell you what, if um, I, you, you might be in geography and planning and you're not using GIS, maybe you use some GIS, or maybe your goal is to really just focus on GIS, but if you're doing anything remotely with GIS, let, immerse, let alone immersing yourself in it, your future is ridiculously bright. It is very, very bright. Um, demand for your skills is just off the hook these days. And um, so I want to get into that. It's going to be the subject of my talk. And um, as you'll see towards the end, um, the door is going to be wide open um, for me to, to help you guys because I live here now and um, I'm right in the backyard, moved up here full time uh, about two years ago and um, really excited to, to jump into this with you guys today. So let's go ahead and do it. Okay, so several topics I want to cover, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we bought this imagery, but I think that's Appalachian State, is it not? I think that's stock photo, but it's really cool, right? Um, I'm going to start by explaining a little bit about why you. I, I, I um, alluded to this a little bit um, in the, or that Lauren alluded to it in her uh, promo thing, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the path, my path, how I got here. I mean, it's definitely taken some twists and turns, just like everybody else. Um, but then I really, I'm not going to spend that much time on that because today is really about you guys and, and my being able to share from my lens that I've looked through now for 20 some odd years uh, in GIS about, you know, what's really going on out there in today's GIS, where I think you really should be spending your time, at least again, through the lens that I look, look through. Um, and then um, also some things that I would consider as far as career prep. And what I think is important to have when you're coming out of when you're coming out of school with a GIS background and you're looking for employment. OK. And so let's go ahead and keep rolling. All right. So so why you? Uh, I had fun with this, but uh, I, I mean it. Um, you know, we hear a lot about data science. And the thing that just cracks me up a little bit, um, and I mean, in a good way, is you know, GIS professionals or people that uh, work in GIS have been data scientists for 40 years. Um, the, the buzz about data science and getting degrees in it and things like this has really come about, you know, certainly in less than the last decade and probably just the last five years. Um, 
but you know, we know that the I and the S and GIS stand for something, right? And um, you know, I think that folks that are in the position that you all are, and, and as you're growing in your career uh, or in your schooling, uh, are fundamentally data scientists. Um, I'll, I'll quote, um, I can't remember who my teacher was at Esri, and I'll talk about my career there in a minute, but for, um, for every feature on a map, there's a row and a table, right? I think we all know that. And um, that kind of gets to the heart of it, if, you, if, you're, if you're tracking with me. And then, you know, look, um, you're all inquisitive pattern and process problem solvers. It, it took me a little bit of time in my voyage uh, to figure out that that was at the root of what was going on with why I kept mixing and exploring. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But, um, you, you know, you're, you have, you've got the DNA that folks want because when you come out, you innately are pattern and process problem solvers. So we're just, we're just going to leave it at that. And then I've noticed that um, many are, if not, it seems like it seems like everybody I run into that's in GIS is just in some way, shape, or form uh, an explorer, an adventurer, somebody that wants to go kind of where no one's gone before, or you're willing to tackle an idea that someone's not tackled before. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in terms of exploration in a second. Um, of course, I had to had to grab this picture of of Baker um, from a couple of years ago and. Um, Funny, we got a chance to speak a little bit when I was over at the university a little bit ago, and uh, it took me back because, uh, you know, there are a lot of folks that um, um, certainly overlap with, and I'll mention some of them in just in just a minute. So I think, you know, you're natively explorers. Um, you're fundamentally spatially aware. Um, you, you get and understand topology. You understand relationships of, you know, um, connectivity and adjacency and containment and what that really means and how that then impacts, you know, your ability to understand and solve the pattern and process um, uh, problems of today. And then I'll just uh, stop by saying, or, or round it out by saying that when I really think about it in terms of all, all my colleagues that I've seen throughout my career in, in GIS specifically, they're different than I would say just a pure, um, you know, a pure coder that's not in a natural science or a, or a, or a um, you know, one of the earthbound sciences, um, and I'm not saying this for everybody, but there just seems to be an innate humanity about the folks that, you know, want to understand people and culture, um, say geography, and you do just have a, a really an outstanding innate humanity about you, and it, it enables you to work well in teams, and that's really important these days. Um, now, I had to just say something real quick here is that, you know, this is a geography department, but I will tell you right now that while a lot of the folks that I've worked with over my career are geographers, many are geologists, many are ecologists, many are, there are data science folks, but there's all the ologies, and it seems like there are a lot of natural scientists that actually find their way to GIS, and, you know, I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute because I think it's um, a pretty logical fit. Okay, let me let me uh, take a look at my notes though. I want to make sure I'm covering the things I wanted to wanted to cover here. Yeah, this is good for now. All right. Okay, so uh, again, why you? Um, you know, uh, I'm going to borrow a slide. I even gave him credit. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say one of my mentors. I had the pleasure of spending time with him. I'll say off and on, but off. Um, I would say a number of uh, folks directly connected to him as well, but that's Jack Dangerman at Esri. I spent a long time there. And, um, you know, the, the Esri as a company really captures the essence of the problems that GIS as a technology, you know, is, is tackling today. And I like this cartoon. It comes from, I think, the, you know, what did I say, the 2021 plenary session that they just did. But we know we have a lot of challenges out there in the world. And at the heart of solving those challenges, I'm not kidding you, is, is you guys. I mean, they're, they're, everywhere I look, you know, it, it, it fundamentally, you know, at the heart of, you know, uh, protecting biodiversity or trying to solve the smart grid problem or trying to solve the EV solutions inside of smart cities, um, you know, GIS really is fundamentally at the heart of a lot of this, um, let alone just helping us understand and better plan for the types of um, 
you know, global pandemics and, and like we've had experienced here recently and we're still in. And um, you know how you come out of that, right? And um, come out stronger, come out better. Now I'm gonna go for something here and you guys tell me if this works because we're gonna try to share a video. And um, if we can hear the sound, I'll be really excited, but I don't know. Can you hear that? Can you guys hear that volume at all? Okay. So um, I think I might, I'm not gonna skip it. Let's put it over here. And let's go for this. I tell you what I'm gonna try. Let's see if I can um, do do do. And that's gonna work. Well, I wish I would have tested it sooner. But anyway, let's go ahead and keep cruising through here. Um, the um, ah, rats. I really would like to play that video. Oh well. Let's keep cruising. All right, so let's um, let's talk a little bit about the path. Um, you know, I uh, I started ASU in 1988. Uh, within a within a couple of years, um, I had the um, you know the the fortune to to have a number of really great mentors and folks that, that you know kind of helped me in my my path. And I'll just I'll just say some names. I mean, Mike Mayfield here, he's on the line. Um, Gary Walker. Um, down in biology, I was I started in biology and I and I took a number of geography classes as well, and that was my major. Um, and then ended up getting a master's at UT in ecology, where I actually did a lot of my GIS study. But um, you know, between uh, you know getting to to sort of scratch the itch of exploration, like I mentioned just a minute ago, let alone kind of start to dig into science. Um, you know, a number of these folks just made a made a big impact on me. And uh, kind of set the foundation for my kind of, I guess you could say, my inquisitive nature about things. But then also, um, believe it or not, uh, you know, get instill a bit of a desire to kind of get into the whole computing world a little bit too. And you have to understand, in the in the early '90s, you know, we were just coming out of you know people working on green screens and stuff. I mean, you barely even had a GUI heads up interface. And, um, you know, by the time I got to UT, you know, we were working with machines that actually did have a GUI interface, but it was still hard. You'd send an email and you'd go down to the other department and wait for it to send five minutes later, right? I mean, <laughs> but, but there was enough going on in modern computing to get you pretty, you know, excited about things. And so um, came back um, from UT, uh, was teaching. Um, I, I actually fortuitously happened on working in the land planning group at Heavenly Mountain back when there was such a thing. And when it was first being developed and had the fortune of working with a gentleman over there that kind of did all the land planning, but he also did all the, the um, all the digital work. So we were working with AutoCAD, we were working with GIS, we were working with a, a bunch of, you know, a good bit of technology. And um, that really just kept opening my eyes. Um, I ended up, uh, let's see, Diana Castano, you guys, some of you may know her. Um, you know, she ended up at Esri, and a year later, uh, they came knocking. And um, you know, when I was back uh, at App after grad school, I was teaching at App as an adjunct as well, and it had discovered that I just had a real passion for teaching too. And so all those things kind of collided together. And the next thing you know, I'm at Esri. And so I was with Esri for quite a long time, and I thought I'd just throw you guys a few things on the screen. And there's there's gonna uh, I'm going to get to a place here towards the end of the, the lecture today or the talk today um, about, you know, the things that have kind of influenced me and put me in a position to where you'll, you'll get an idea of the lens that I look through or see through. And um, I think it'll also help you with knowing that if you have questions of me in the future, um, I, there's, there's quite a number of folks that I have relationships with to, these, to this day in the organizations that I've worked with, let alone the, the software companies and, and, and companies that I've worked with. So when I first started at Esri and training, and then I kind of evolved that, I worked with a, a, a largely with um, the USDA and the US um, DOI. And it was all about, you know, solving and tackling challenges and problems that they solve. So a lot of things related to, um, 
you know, our, our natural world, right? And the management and, ma and maintenance of, of resources, of natural resources. And um, that, that really kind of kept growing into where I was um, developing programs for um, the USDA and the service center agencies. So Farm Service Agency, Natural Resource Conservation Service and things like this. And then that quickly started to expand um, because I was just, I kept learning all the, you know, the ESRI tech and different ways to apply it. We were starting to develop these large custom classes for lots of, um, for, um, for the, Fed. In, this, in this case, I worked on the federal civilian side. And then I was like, all right, well, let's, let's keep going with this. And so while I was still in educational services, um, I started getting a little bit of business development. Um, and I um, was working primarily in the Southeast at that point, even though I had a, a bit of a stint out in Colorado. And I had the fortune to work with Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, um, a number of the DOE uh, agencies and the NASA agencies all in the Southeast. And my eyes just kept getting expanded and open to the problems and things that the, the, the things that the challenges they were tackling. You know, so everything just from e ecological and environmental management to, um, you know, test hole monitoring because of, you know, nasty stuff that might be in the ground or even just, you know, uh, future planning and explorations to, um, you know, places off this planet, right? And, you know, how you set up the, the, um, the uh, coordinate systems and things like this for actually figuring out how you're going to tool around Mars and stuff like that. Um, but I would say that one of the things that I was really not just proud of, but it was just really neat to be involved with it was with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians because I don't know if you guys know it, but you know their their territory, the territory, what they what they owned, right, was massive, massive. It was a huge part of the you know the United or the Eastern United States. And you know, obviously that became pretty whittled down over time, but the, the neat project there was to reconstruct their parcel in land ownership from the beginning to today and do it with GIS, the scanning of documents, the scanning of really interesting things actually, to get you to a place to where you could actually um, track that over time. And it was, it was a really neat, neat thing to do. Um, so um, definitely know those folks over there, a uh, neat group. So then, then things continue to progress, and um, you guys have probably heard of indoor GIS, ArcGIS indoors, and things like this. And I don't know how I happened onto this. I think I was just the guy in the back of the room trying to solve 3D problems all the time because that was sort of at the heart of what um, honestly kind of drove me into the science a little bit. I'll mention a little bit more about that in just a second. But I, I just happened to be sort of at the right spot at the right time, I guess, too, because. Um, folks were wanting to take GIS indoors. And so uh, we did that on the federal side and then that kind of cascaded into the building interior space data model and it all has grown up today into this ArcGIS indoors product. But as you might imagine, I worked with a bunch of folks that were interested in that. The General Service Administration, um, there were connections to the Office of Management and Budget at the time, the architect of the Capitol, the um, National Capital Planning Commission, a lot of folks that were re responsible for all the facilities that kind of in the guts of the DC Beltway area that kind of make the city tick. And that's when I really actually started to expand GIS into the world of asset and operational management because it all started to, to tie together. Um, and uh, it's amazing um, if you know what actually goes on in DC um, underground. It's, 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 it's crazy stuff. But um, I did spend the better part of seven years every other week commuting to DC and, and getting to uh, work with a number of really interesting groups. And then that sort of did transform a little bit into working um, in the commercial sector um, with folks that were just really interested in, in managing you know, their, their interior space um, all, over, all over the world. I then did a, uh, I, I left Esri after about 17 years, I'd started to get into the professional services world, consulting and things. And I did a little stint with JLL Technology Solutions, um, big real estate organizations. Uh, had a great time. I spent um, the entire time pretty much that I was with them um, out in um, Sunnyvale, California with Google. I was working with the Google Real Estate and Workplace Services Group. Really interesting group of people. Um, and uh, with a host of challenges, um, got to a place though to where we just weren't doing enough GIS. So I was like, all right, let's go to a whole service firm, a whole service engineering firm, 
where we can do all that stuff. So that's what I did. And um, like I said, some twists and turns along the way. And now it's just sort of like we work with a, a number of different um, number of different types of clients. This is just a handful, but you know everything from the state property office for the state of North Carolina, for managing all the real property assets for the state owned and leased property, to um, Lakewood, Colorado, to High Point University here in the backyard, um, to Argonne National Lab, um, and in each case, it's you know has something to do with utilities um, management, um, asset management, or facilities asset management. In some cases, environmental um, environmental management, and then and then we're a big today. I'm with Patrick. And we are a provider to a number of the investor-owned utilities as well as your municipal utilities, and um, and that's that's kind of where I'm where I'm at today. And so if I just kind of click this one more time, you know, I'm with a firm that does these things, right? So we we do everything from uh, renewables, uh, engineering and design and construction, to then the management of those renewables, and we use a lot of GIS there. So whether it's wind, whether it's solar, those are the two primary ones. Um, but we work with municipalities, we work with higher ed institutions, we work with industrial um, plants, we work with in, in industrial manufacturing, um, transportation infrastructure, uh, kind of runs the gamut. And as I kind of go through the rest of the um, presentation here, I'll be highlighting a number of these pockets of places where, you know, today I'm, I'm, we're involved actively with um, solving a lot, of, a lot of the nation's problems, just like we were just talking about a minute ago. Okay, so I, I, I chunked this in here and I, I couldn't decide whether I was gonna automate back and forth between it, but I, I wanna make sure that if you're a young person that's watching this today and you're just kind of getting started in your, your career or your, your, your studies, right? You're not even in a career yet. Um, believe me, it took me forever to figure out what a career was gonna be for me. Um, but I just wanna encourage you all throughout your process. And this is where I really owe a lot to, to Mike Mayfield and Gary Walker and some of these folks because they encouraged us to get out there and explore, right? And I, and I remember fondly trips to, uh, to Costa Rica um, and, and I ended up doing an undergraduate thesis where I did, I think, what was it called, Mike? The Phytogeography of Costa Rica, I think is what it was called. And, um, you know, uh, take advantage of those opportunities. Um, I can't tell you enough, um, you know, whether it's in the Appalachians or whether it's in the Canadian Yukon, where I spent three years going up there with American Alpine Club and the Alpine Club of Canada doing a bunch of neat studies, or whether you're in the rainforest of Central America or South America doing, you know, studying animals, studying plants, whatever it is, you know, all this stuff will come back to benefit you. Um, what I didn't realize at the time is that intrinsically what was happening was I was realizing that I really was a pattern process um, kind of person. Like I was really interested in landform and what I came to know was, hey, you're actually really interested in geomorphology. I didn't even know what the word was, but I was like, oh, okay, that's what I'm interested in. And then, you know, patterns and of, of why this is here, why that's over there the intersection and interconnection of biology and ecology and geography and geology. And, you know, it was, it was until I got to graduate school that I realized, huh, you know, I'm out here, uh, my, my, my master's was in studying the plants that grow on cliffs. And you guys may know Mike Madrich at, at, um, at ASU and obviously Gary Walker for years. And Gary had inspired me to do this too. And that's what I you know, ended up going to UT to do. And the thing that was driving me crazy, though, is there was a lack of tools to study a 3D problem, right? I was trying to study things on a vertical cliff face. And so, you know, you wrap this all together and it really started pushing me to where I, I really wanted to get into GIS. And, um, you know, I would just encourage you to explore, 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 because it will have a positive and profound impact on your ability to solve problems, right? It will help you contribute interesting ideas. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to meet a heck of a lot of super cool, like-minded and interesting people uh, along the way. Okay. Um, today's GIS, what's hot? So we're going to shift gears a little bit. Keep, take, keep an eye on the clock here. Um, I think we have about 25 minutes. That's good. 
All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cruise through this pretty quickly, but let's let's just talk. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a lens that, that I see through that a lot of folks in, in industry see through. Um, I will tell you this, I'm gonna share with you guys a number of examples, and, and I want, want you to take this to heart. I will not share with you any example that where I'm not actively working in that um, with those capabilities today, or that I know people that are. And I can't emphasize enough to you the network that you're growing as, as budding geographers and GIS folks, but you're going to meet a lot of amazing people along the way. And I've had the good fortune to, to build some really neat friendships and have a lot of really neat connections with not just people at the, these cool clients that I've worked with, but that are in technology today. And I'll mention some of that when we get to the career stuff in just a moment. Okay, so I promise you this is the only not cool eye chartish looking slide on my show. So I, I need to kind of grease the skids with this a little bit though, because you know we talk a lot that I've seen, especially after I got out of school in terms of GIS about the assets that GIS frankly is used to help manage, right? And help um, you know folks operate and maintain and perform well. And so there's this whole side of the equation where there's an asset life cycle and it's all about streamlining and automating processes and tasks, right? And then you've got this massive set of technologies out there these days that are used to organize and integrate and analyze and report on these assets, right? Well, it is an absolute acronym soup. I do this on purpose because you can go and try to look at some of these up. But the key thing I'm trying to articulate most of the time is that RGIS over and over and increasingly is being discovered and, and um we see is that it's, it is this transformational technology when you want to go from this ad hoc and reportable state to a managed state of your data to, you know, data that can truly be used for preventative and predictive types of analysis, right? And I, I get, I could, trust me, I could teach a whole, I could teach a, um, uh, a semester long class on just this topic because, um, of how GIS is being used to be that glue, to be that integrating platform that is increasingly being used to kind of bring all these things together. And in some cases, reduce the total cost of ownership of all this tech being used today in order to accomplish, accomplish all the efficiencies over here in, in the asset life cycle. So let's take a look at a few of those things. Number one, and I don't know that I've got them all numbered, but first one, um, this whole notion of GIS being able to take your digital twins, and if you're not familiar with that terminology, you need to get familiar with that terminology, the digital twin. What this to you and me, to you and I as GIS folks means is the natural in the built environment gets represented in a GIS, right? Well, the natural and built environment can be represented in something, uh, a CAD, right? An AutoCAD drawing. It can be represented in a LIDAR point cloud scan. It can be represented in a, in, in more increasingly, if you're designing something in a BIM, a building information model. And the thing to note is that there's this intersection now where GIS and BIMs and the whole world of digital twins is, is meshing together very nicely. Um, I'll say that, you know, over the course of my career, um, Autodesk and, and Esri as two companies didn't necessarily always see eye to eye on everything, but now they've really formed a tight connection that's not just marketing anymore. It's like real tools. And, you know, you're seeing things like GeoBIM. You're seeing real tools that help people that do the engineering and the design and all these things up front actually really get directly meshed with your GIS tools. So you really want to be tuned in and dialed into this because it is a lot of what you're going to continue to see in the future. So this notion of from design to being built to operational um, for the built environment is very, very much has GIS at the core of it. And then, of course, I mentioned ArcGIS indoors. And, um, you know, again, another representative a representation of a digital twin, but now you can actually use the dynamic power of GIS to go not just from outdoors, from outdoors seamlessly into the indoors. And that's going to actually underscore some things I'm going to bring up here in just a second. Okay, so I've, um, I've, I've really gotten into over the last, I don't know, five years or so, this whole notion of using intelligent 360 imagery um, data collection to immediately go in and, and scan, like you can see there's somebody holding this intelligent 360 camera that goes both indoors and outdoors. And from these scans, you can directly do feature extraction 
And by the way, it is all G, G, GIS or, you know, excuse me, GPS enabled. And you can immediately extract all the features inside the buildings and pull them into GIS. You can do the same thing outdoors. Um, and what we typically do now is pull those data into some asset management system. I work with Cartograph is one, CityWorks is another. You guys have probably heard of different asset management systems. But we literally can seamlessly take and extract data and get them into GIS, marry those up with asset management systems, and then enable all these tools, right? So you can tag assets, you can scan them. They're GIS based, you can find them. You can effectively really support um, a lot of these operational efficiencies when it comes to um, managing your assets, right? And so that's kind of a world I've been swimming in. And again, same thing, you've got the outdoor side of this where you scan outdoors for everything from locating um, all the light poles. And this is when you don't have any data, right? And you need to populate it for the first time. Well, you can literally not LIDAR scan, but do Im use imagery, it's lighter weight, um, it's it's um, faster, more efficient to do the processing on, and you can feature extract, right, all this data and populate a GIS if you're populating it for the first time. Okay, next piece, drones, and I, and we're going to cover a lot here, so you guys just just hang on, hang in there with me. So drones, um, this is kind of where if I was in the room with you guys, and I really like um, interacting with folks, but I'd be like getting a show of hands. How many of you guys have Play with a drone or know about drones, and I assume a lot of you have. Um, but uh, the whole world of collecting data with drones is ramping very fast. And so um, I highlight one company, uh, another guy that started it, um, known very well, um, a guy named Mike Helander, started Airspace Link. Now, what's cool about Airspace Link? Well, if you want to fly a drone and you want to know that you're flying it in the right place and you don't, you don't just want a mission plan for capturing data for the day. You want to know that when if you're doing it on a large scale, you're, you're UPS and you're trying to deliver packages or you're the hospital and you're trying to deliver vital medicine over here. You have to know where you can navigate. Well, these guys um, actually provide the maps and the tools and, the, and they're one of only a few companies that interacts directly with the FAA to approve a flight plan like on the fly with their tools. OK. Um, you want to keep them in mind, and they're hiring like crazy. So if this interests any, any of you guys and you get ready to get out of school, let me know. I know these guys really well, okay? Next thing, ArcGIS um, site scan. So ArcGIS, uh, you know, Esri came out with, um, what was it called? Um, <laughs> drone to map. <laughs> so they came out with a drone to map tool. And then they recently, or in the last year, bought a company called SightScan, which is even cooler because now you, you guys have probably heard of Drone Deploy. Well, now Esri basically has you know the soup to nuts um, mission planning with a Drone Deploy like thing that not only lets you plan your mission in, in your path, but it lets you then collect the data. It all goes up into a GIS cloud, processes it, and immediately makes it available for a GIS user huge, huge step. It's a big leap because usually you get stuck in the processing piece and it would cost you more money or moving things here and there would just, there'd be a little bit, little bit lossy as we call it in the data world. Well, now it just all goes in there and it's available now. And um, we're starting to use this as well. And, and, and in particular for a lot of our renewable projects and things like that. Okay, I gotta, I gotta speed up here. So another key area, um, uh, I actually know the CEO well. She was my director at Esri. Her name's Sheila Stephenson. Wonderful, wonderful lady. But she's the CEO of the U.S. arm now of, of One Spatial. And if you're into how to automate the process of checking your GIS data, um, so rules-based data checking and correction, um, let alone a lot of attributes and attributes from multiple systems, this is an amazing company for doing that. And um, it's definitely a niche that is never going to go away, and it's only going to expand. So I can't encourage you enough. Whoops. Let me do that. I was trying to turn this phone off. Let me go back. But I can't encourage you enough to, like, just check out the company, but check out the field. And, you know, there, I'm going to make a recommendation here in a little bit. But, um, you know, at the heart of a lot of what they do is um, – uh, utilizing the product, a product you may have heard of called Safe Software, and specifically their feature manipulation engine. It's also the engine that's behind um, the ArcGIS data interoperability extension, but they take this leagues beyond that 
um, into a set of tools that I think are, are, are definitely um, not just at the front of the tech, but right there in the heart of it. And um, they're used a lot, both in Europe and then increasingly in the United States. All right, I'm gonna shift gears for a second. So huge trend, you guys have seen it, but just latch on to it because it's not going away. Um, that is the ability to pull real time, both structured and structured uh, data, big data uh, into GIS. Sometimes it involves the use of Kubernetes and that obviously speeds up the process. Don't ask me to get in the guts of that because I need to bring a big data scientist in here to help me help me out with that one, um, let alone just the environment, right, that you're able to deliver to support just the, the um, analyzing of massive amounts of data. Now, um, maybe not necessarily with, with regard to COVID, but we know that we're populating a lot of this data into really helpful dashboards to help decision making. So whether it's incident monitoring or whether it's global pandemics, um, you know, just keep your eye on real time and big data because it is here to stay. And um, folks are getting a lot of jobs right out of school in this area, to be honest with you. Okay, so then I'm just gonna click on these and you'll see them draw over time. But these are some of the things that I do actively right now, we do in our company. So, you know, we have solutions for that built environment and I mean the indoor environment, right? So whether it's indoor facility safety and security, getting folks building assets and data in um, to GIS and to other systems for the first time and let alone doing inventory and condition assessments. Um, and then also being able to get, the, get it to a place where you're actually in a work or operations management system. So Cartograph, we're um, a partner of Cartograph. Um, then the whole world of utilities. Uh, we do a lot of solutions for um, outdoor electric utility um, a management. And so you can build, you know, really cool tools with the latest of Esri's um, utility network management tools, uh, which, you know, is the basically the successor to something called a geometric network, which first came out at ArcGIS 8.3. Um, but just amazing tools that, you know, in fact, Mike Mayfield, you'll love this. Um, I always go back to his um, hydrology class when we were talking about sources and sinks, right? And, you know, how you would be able to model that not model flow, you know, in a river system. And I think back to it, it's like, you know, we, we were doing this stuff, but we didn't quite have the tools to do the things we wanted to. And, and then I, when I started to see that at Esri and, and beyond, it's been pretty amazing to see where it's gotten to today. And so then, you know, whether it's outdoor electric utilities and water and gas and all these other utilities or indoor so we, we're indoors, right? So, and this is just an example of indoor electric system inspection and reporting. So you can take GIS tools to do the surveys and the field collection and inform the whole process of doing inspections for something like electric systems. And then there's like big broad ranging things for um, investor owned utilities where you're doing grid modern, modernization and operational analytics and you're, you're, you're combining with BI tools like Tableau and Power BI and other things and ArcGIS all together into a common a common view. And then, you know, we do a lot with gas utilities, natural gas. Um, and we have a number of solutions here. You can see, so it's dashboards and automated processes when you're, you're in the field for inspection, tracking, traceability, um, utility networks for, you know, for gas, you know, show me, you know, here's the leak, show me the valves I have to turn off, show me the uh, customers that are impacted. And then, you know, with a number of utilities, you're in a highly regulated space. So this is where you really use a lot of the, the power of GIS analysis to do thing like, like a sliding mile analysis to show high consequence and medium consequence. Actually, let me click the next button. High consequence and medium consequence analysis, which is a requirement you know, for gas companies and things like this. And I think this is nearly one of my last ones. We do a lot with telecom as well. Um, we Comcast is a big client and some others, but we, uh, we help them with understanding serviceability. And this is where, you know, if you're in GIS uh, now and you're really interested in network analysis, it's a huge, huge field. And I encourage you to just keep going after it because whether you're, when you're analyzing a transportation network or a telecom network, um, the way you can wait and do cost estimation along that network um, is, a, is, a, is a really um, valuable skill, skill set to have. And you can sort of see some of the other things that we do here too. Okay, so let's culminate me showing you indoors and me showing you utilities and stuff. And just to say kind of a, a 
something that's been near and dear to me over time is actually working with college campuses and universities. And I've done that for a number of years. It started with the indoor stuff and now I do it a lot with the outdoor or outdoor utilities too, as well as grounds and gardens and a bunch of different things. But, um, you know, we tend to look at um, the university and, you know, break it up into different groupings. So the campus, the building, utilities, safety, transportation. I'll highlight utilities right here because we just did this um, Esri said, you know, Esri has these webinars, right? And the one going on right now on the ed side is spatially enabling campuses with GIS. Um, they invited us to be part of the first one in the kickoff. And so I just go look it up and check it out. It's pretty cool. It's fun to be able to join them and, and talk a little bit about that. But just so you know that, you know, holistically, you can bring it all together and serve the needs of an entire campus um, and their needs and how they can actually you know, boost what they're doing operationally, let alone on capital planning and a lot of other things, um, you know, if you're taking advantage of GIS. Okay, we have, um, Kara, are you there? I think I have 20 minutes, right? Is that right? I got yeah. 20 minutes. Okay, just a little feedback, cool. All right, so I need at least 10. All right, so let's pivot for a second. Um, and don't worry, you guys, I'll be back. You're not going to see me for the last time here, right? That's the point of me, me talking to you right now. Too. So um, I live here now. It's all right. And, I'm, and I love doing this kind of stuff. So let's pivot to a little bit of career preparation and some recommendations. But I first want to look at the landscape. And so number one, don't forget, we are absolutely in a digitally interconnected world now. Um, many things are censored. Many things are monitored. There are lots of, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, data feeds coming in and we and, and the, the best way to really analyze it and to, and to uh, help make informative decisions, we know is if it's a location-based type of analysis. I love the Port of Rotterdam example. Obviously they're, you know, they're big GIS users. And I always tell the fun fact that the most expensive, um, uh, the price per linear inch is along the docks of this port. I can't remember what the dollar figure is per inch of being able to dock your boat, but it's the most expensive in the world. Okay, um, so digitally interconnected world. So keep that in mind. So where are the jobs um, and where, what do we see? Um, there are a lot, and I did a, a talk with the, um, the senior class, um, what is it called, the, the career development um, class. And we went through this a little bit, but I'll share this with you all as you begin to plan your, you know, your, your trajectory of you know the courses and things that you're going to take. So um, certainly utilities, renewables, transportation, infrastructure, really anything with a smart in front of it. You guys seen the buzzwords, right? Smart city, smart grid, um, smart um, uh, what is it called? Um, smart grid, smart city, smart campus, smart everything, right? Well. You know, GIS is at the heart of a lot of these solutions, and they're all front and center right now in terms of where jobs are available. Um, and then, you know, look, I mean, there's a lot of municipal um, jobs as well as working for universities, campus, building utility infrastructure. Um, it's very hot because a lot of folks are, frankly, um, changing and switching out a lot of aging infrastructure. Um, they're building new buildings or they're retrofitting and renovating others. And um, I show this one just because a colleague of mine just, just came from this group and he was largely responsible for turning all the operational systems on inside of this very building, which won a lot of awards. But, um, it, but, but it's happening right now. Um, in other words, the jobs are available in, in, in high demand in this niche. Uh, you know, swim lane that GIS has always provided a lot of service in, um, public safety, health, emergency management, security operations centers, um, you know, a world of opportunity there. And then, you know, I like to highlight this because, you know, don't forget about this. And this kind of, you know, that's where I got my start. But there are a lot of technology providers out there that are, are looking for GIS professionals. Okay. Like I said, you're natively data scientists. You're natively problem solvers. They know this, right? And you can say stay in industry or go out of industry, but they're really just a lot of companies. And they are all hiring right now like crazy. Okay. And so just... Keep that in mind that the technology providers and the service providers um, um, have a lot of jobs out there right now. Okay. A few minutes. I think I'm doing good on time. This is where I need to spend a little bit of time. So you're a freshman, you're a sophomore, probably a sophomore now, and you're like, all right, 
I'm digging this GIS stuff or in geography and planning. I'm seeing a little GIS. Um, you know, what could I maybe add to really reinforce what I'm trying to where I'm trying to get by the time I get out of school or go to graduate school, whatever it is. Well, the first thing I want to say is if if you're not yet, you got to go all in with enterprise platforms and solutions. What does that mean? You got to start to steer away from file-based data data interaction and management because it is very quickly um, going away, and in many cases is completely gone and le or it's legacy data. We still we still from a a asset lifecycle perspective work with a lot of file-based data because a lot of it comes from the um, the upstream end of things, but even there it's being replaced with more truly web, fully web enabled um, design groups and things that really never exchange files on desktop machines anymore. Everything is in a cloud. Everything is web service based, right? And so now's the time to be doing that if you haven't already. All right, so things that I think you need to add into the equation. Number one, call it CIS, okay? Um, Computer Information Systems or Sciences. So. As a GIS professional, if you're coming out and you want to have that degree, you really need to understand the fundamentals of relational databases, okay? Um, you need to know how to do some SQL scripting, okay, in order to be able to form a, a, a specific query or a filter um, on your data. Um, it's really helpful to understand if I say ETL, you really kind of need to know what that means. You need to know that means extract, translate, load of data and those fundamentals. And so, you know, whether it be via geoprocessing tools or more importantly, things like an FME, a feature manipulation engine workbench, which is safe software, it's, it's, it's gonna be good to know these things. And then, you know, cloud hosted environments. So are you familiar with or have an understanding of working in an Amazon web services environment or a Microsoft Azure environment or a Google um, hosted environment? And then there's just the information security fundamentals because um, as you might imagine, it's a big deal. And you have to understand not only how data moves, but how you keep it secure. And there are a lot of product protocols and controls and, and tools that are you know, associated with that. Okay, and then there's things that might actually fall into just straight computer science, software engineering and stuff like this. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say as a GIS professional, you, you just gotta go become a coder, okay? But what I will say is that it will it will help you get deeper into your career if you into that career if you just have some fundamentals. So Python scripting is a big deal. Um, it helps a lot now. Uh, yeah, it's a fundamental tool inside of GIS and ArcGIS as a tool, um, as well as open source GISs and, and lots of different systems these days, because it helps with data automation. Right? It helps you um, automate backend tasks and things like this. Um, and then switch from Python over to um, just a fundamental understanding of web services how they're used to move information back and forth across systems or within a system um, from like the server side to the consumptive side with your end users and the apps that they're using. And then just even a foundational understanding of JavaScript API coding and fundamentals. And, and here's the thing, let me just say this. I don't, I'm not saying you need to you do all this, right? I'm just saying sprinkle in little pieces of this. And I think it's going to really help, help your, you know, your, your, um, not only you, you're getting a job right out of school, but also uh, your career. Another swim lane that I think is really important is mobile. So um, if you're not already studying it in school, and I would encourage app to do this, is you really got to pepper in there the latest field collection tools, whether it's drone stuff, LIDAR data collection, which frankly is very heavy and bulky. And um, I'm not going to say antiquated because we use it a lot because it's so precise. But there are a lot of other tools that are lighter weight with a with a lighter data impact than LIDAR that are emerging that you could also extract LIDAR from, but the cost is not as heavy up front. And then, of course, there are just the things that you need to learn, right, in field collection when it comes to getting a very accurate position. So RTK units, um, understanding GNNS receivers, GPS, and this is when I say things like Tremble and Leica and Bad Elf. That really is a thing, a Bad Elf. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up. Um, as well as the software that allows you to process the data. And I mentioned, you know, site scan earlier. And then there's mobile apps for the field. So, you know, Esri's now shifted everything over to this ArcGIS field maps tool. We do a lot with it. It's amazing what you can do now. If I go in the field and I scan a barcode and it's 18 digits long, 
there are parts of that code that I parse out that allow me to get the make, manu manufacture, model, and pre-populate all that in one, one fell swoop. Don't have the time to show you all that now, but there's some amazing, amazing stuff that we're doing, you know, in the field with these tools. And then still better yet, surveys, right? Surveying um, an environment or like one of our clients, uh, we use the survey tool, uh, survey one, two, three for surveying other meters, right? Because the meters were being added to their GIS and it was all about um, um, documenting all the locations of smart meters and stuff like this. And then also along with mobile, um, something that's been coming about for a few years is the lightweight scripting and expressions used for doing calculations with the mobile tools and among others, and that's the use of Arcade. And so understanding what that means and, and how it's used. And then lastly, it's a lot to get your head wrapped around, but it's really cool. It's something that I've been dabbling in myself, you know, with these uh, intelligent 360 cameras and such, but it's all about reality capture, right? So you hear about augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and then, um, oh my gosh, the X, extended reality, I think is what they're calling it now. Um, but there are a lot of tools that help you there. And so I wrote a few of these down. So on the 360 imagery side, um, indoor view, Matterport, Navviz, on, uh, then there's 3D visualization tools. So, you know, you're maybe used to using the scenes in ArcGIS. Um, then there's ArcGIS Urban, you've got indoors, you got City Engine, and then unique, interesting companies, not the C is purposely not in there, but ARGIS for augmented reality GIS. Um, and if you're a gamer, I mean, GIS is um, massive in gaming now, right? I mean, there's so many movies that now use City Engine for their backdrops and everything. But if you're into gaming, um, or and or doing scenario planning, um, whether you know whether it's for a um, for a lot of things, right? Where are you going to uh, site the planning of a positioning of a new building or a utility that's going here or there? Um, being able to work with Unity and Oculus and Hololens and now this new thing, um, extended reality for ArcGIS, um, it's just a big field. And so I think peppering in a little bit of these things into you know your curriculum and, and what you're coming out of school with would be will be immensely helpful for you. Okay, and so I only have two more slides here, and I think I'm going to end pretty good uh, on time-wise. Um, you know, in terms of trends in GIS careers, I just picked out a couple little things that, that we see. And so, you know, what has been traditionally um, going after that GIS analyst job right out of school, right? So we, we bring on junior GIS analysts, GIS analysts, senior GIS analysts, GIS interns, um, and or or increasingly we're hiring for a GIS specialist. And when we're hiring for a GIS specialist, the differentiator here is not only do you have a really strong foundation in using GIS tools for doing all the really awesome pattern and trend and network types of analysis or data conversions and data automation, you actually know how to get under the hood a little bit. You know how to get into the relational database, you have SQL query skills, and or you know how to do this task automation and extend the and extend like a GP service or a geoprocessing tool with Python coding. So Python coding is a big thing. And that's a bit of the differentiator there. And that may just mean adding a few ingredients from um, CS or CIS into your mix to be able to come out and be a, a viable candidate for a, a, GIS, a GIS specialist job. And then, you know, there are junior GIS developers, GIS developers, full stack web developers, solution architects, if this is your path, I'm just going to tell you um, there is a, a healthy um, demand for these skills, um, and you 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 can kind of forge your own path, right? So you know if you come out and, and it takes a little while to become an effective and, and and really really good solution architect, but some people are learning this in school um, as data architects and things like this or or enterprise system architects. But I would say, you know, it is in high demand. If you understand the cloud infrastructures, if you know a little bit about this JavaScript or JavaScript 4.0 versus 3.0, and if you are a coder, by the way, you need to have a GitHub repository, right? You need to have this or, or see at least some kind of hub repository where you can go and you can show code samples to the folks that are going to be interested in at least getting an understanding of how you solve problems and how you use code you know, to do that. Okay, so just a couple things there. And it's time for me to summarize um, or just, just mention that A, I started by saying that your future is super bright. 
I am not kidding you. It is massively bright. And I think that as a, as a GI, somebody with GIS skills coming out of ASU and the geography department, um, the industry needs you and they need you badly, very badly. Okay. Um, you know, I, so I want to emphasize that. Second thing I want to emphasize is I'm here to help. I'm in the neighborhood. Um, I look forward to interacting more with the geography department and the folks in it. They're wonderful people. And, um, you know, I'm at that part of my career. Um, I'm all about, I, I, I want to give back. I want to give back more. So I'm here. Um, I have lots of connections in the industry. I showed you, I know a number of these people that I mentioned um, in all those slides and in all those descriptions of different businesses. And all of them are hiring. Um, let me just say this, your department cares too. It's another, another reason I'm, I'm here and I'm offering this info. Um, they asked me to come in and share these things, but they do that because not just because I'm an alumni and stuff like this, but because they care, they care about you guys. They want you to land in really good positions. And, and, and at the end of the day, like on that Jack Dangerman slide, they know that you can make a tremendous impact in this world. And I mean that. And there is this innate humanity that I talked about and it's a real thing. And so your department cares. Um, and then, and they like planting good seeds. And that's why the little seeds are right there because these little seeds pop up all over the place and you never know where they're gonna, where they're gonna pop up. And then, you know, look, I mean, I get kind of jazzed about ASU evolving into a top GIS school. It's got a great GIS program. I, I kind of grabbed this online and maybe there's something different, but there's a GIS concentration that's cool. But I mean, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that, you know, I think that increasingly you can do to where, you know, it's, it's an awesome GIS school. And um, I'd, I'd love to be a part of that too. So anyway, um, I think this is it. I'm saying thank you. I've enjoyed spending time with you. This is my contact information. Um, and folks at the school, you know, know that um, my, I have my contact information as well. And hopefully I'll be able to see some of you guys around the halls of, uh, of Rankin Science Building in the future. And with that, I'll turn it back over to whomever is going to moderate from here. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I, I guess um, our students will have some kind of questions for you. Um, we have uh, several minutes. So if anyone of you have any qu question, just unmute your, uh, and then just ask a question. Um, hey, well, I'll stop the video so I can kind of put all this away. Oh, Hold on. That's not what I meant to do. Uh, where's the stop? There we go. Stop share. So I'll stop sharing. Kind of pull everybody over here so I can kind of face everybody. Cool. All right, fire away. What do you guys got? Was that was that just like a information overload? Boom. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. It's awesome stuff. John, I'll I'll go ahead and and uh, and ask a quick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, thank you, by the way, for providing all that information. I'm I'm Derek. I haven't actually met you. I'm the graduate program director here, and so Sweet. actually, yeah. uh, a lot of the folks that we have here today are graduate students. Awesome. Uh, many of them with uh, with GIS backgrounds, and so um, you know, I'm wondering uh, if you could speak a little bit to the you know what someone coming out of here with a graduate education. Uh, particularly with GIS experience might have to offer, not just necessarily to your company, but um, you know, the, the things you do in general. Oh, absolutely. And, and let me just underscore this too. I think um, uh, Saskia knows this too, but I mean, even though I mentioned this stuff my company does, I'm, I'm not recruiting, okay? But if you guys come and ask me if I have a job to fill, I'll probably tell you yes. Okay. But I'm more interested in you getting to the right spot for you. Because if you said to me, hey, I want to go work for a company doing the do, uh, collecting drone data and doing flight planning, I'm going to steer you over to Mike Helander's company at, at, um, at Air Link, um, Airspace Link. But to answer your question more directly, Derek, really good question. Um, if you're asking me, in terms of salary or position of what you gain with a master's versus a BS, is that kind of what you're along the line? Yeah, on? yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm headed that direction, yeah. Okay, no, that's fine. I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm, unlike a lot of people, I'm very transparent. I'm very open about what people, um, what, a, what a position's salary range is. Um, and then also, I think the first way I would answer your question, though, is this. Um, the biggest thing, the most important thing is not just that you have the master's degree, 
but I want to know what you did while you were in school. Like, did you take on projects? Did you have a side job, you know, working for a company, like doing real GIS work while you were in school? You'd be surprised just how many people do, okay? Or in your research, what kind of a set of questions did you, did you um, answer, right? And then in answering them, what GIS tools specifically did you use and how did you go about using them, you know? And I think when you have a master's degree or so, as, as I've seen, you've just answered more questions typically. You've had more time, you've, and you've also, I mean, if you, if you, um, is it a, a, is an MS where you have to do a thesis? Is that what y'all offer? Or you have a well, we offer, we offer an MA, but they still do a thesis. Yeah. Okay. So they still do a thesis. That's cool. So, I mean, um, I'm not going to say we really, you know, dig too much into, did you do the thesis, but it's really just, do, do you articulate to, to us in the resume, you know, the, the number of different types of challenges that you, that you solved? And um, the more diverse those are, honestly, the more marketable it makes you. Um, now, salary-wise, if you have an MS, that could be a twenty dollars to $25,000 difference. To be quite honest with you, or more. Now, if you if you add on top of that, now I'll just be frank, okay? If you add on top of that all these coding, a lot of coding, <laughs> and you're a developer and you have some of those skills, it's going to be even north of there. And you know, you I, I'm, again, I'm shooting you guys straight. You may come out with a BS with a little bit of a minor in CS or CIS, where you're doing a lot of coding and you may command a higher salary than somebody coming out of just pure GIS with no coding with an MS. It's just, just the world we live in now. That is fantastic information. Thank you, John. <laughs> really, no, I mean, I just, you know, just kind of laying it out there, yeah. But I mean, here's the deal though, there's jobs for everybody. <laughs> it's, 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 we're not in a situation where there's just not, not job. There are plenty of jobs out there. And here's the thing, if you're not finding them, let me know, because they're, they're, they're definitely out. I think you guys are nodding your heads. You know they're out there. You just want to be, now watch this. Here's the other thing. How many folks like me hire folks right out of school right now? Not many. Uh, now you're going, well, John, you just told me there's a lot of jobs. Number one, number one thing I, I said, I mentioned this in the um, professional, go to career development um, class with the seniors. And I'll mention this to the, the, the graduate students too. Um, and by the way, I'm cognizant of time. Do we need to stop? No, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. I'll keep going. You guys just tell me when we need, when we need to stop. Um, so where was I going with that? Oh my gosh. What path oh, you're, you were talking about um, about jobs being plentiful, but maybe not for recent graduates or something along that path. Right. No, no, no. So, so my path I was heading down was, hey, John, you just said there's lots of jobs out there, but what if I'm just graduating? Well, if you're if you have a master's degree um, and you've done a fair amount of that research, we would probably just grab you directly into or, or bring you into, excuse me, a, 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 a full time position. But what we've seen increasingly out there, which I think is an amazing opportunity, is paid internships. And they're pretty good. I mean, the paid internships, six-month paid internship, I, honestly, I like to do that because I get to just to see what you got, right? I mean, for six months, you come in and you get thrown a range of things. And, and if it's on the analyst side or on the developer side, we're going to throw a lot at you. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to learn how to automate the heck out of some data. You're going to learn how to clean some data. Then you're going to then you're going to start getting in some analysis. And then we may you know throw a coding challenge at you or something like that. Um, you know, it, it allows us to basically just kind of test out what you got. And then and then usually those when we um, provide somebody an offer like that, we just say you know it's the possibility of converting to a full time role at six months or or before. I mean, we may define out in two months that you're just the bee's knees, right? And we'll just make you know a full-time offer. And you know, those are, those are good roles. So my biggest thing, and this is what I did mention to the um, career development class is put on your resume, open to paid internship because the employer will really glom onto that. Now, it's not like you're trying to cut yourself out of the running for a full-time position, but 
just note that if you don't have at least that one to three years, they're all looking for one to three years or at least a couple of years, you know, of experience. And you can, you can kind of short circuit that and show them that you're creative if you throw out that, you know, I'm, I'm open to an internship. And let me just tell you this too. In the past, I would say take an internship if it's not paid, but I would not do that today. I mean, these companies have money um, and they can pay you. They can, they can do a paid internship. Okay, if they're offering a not non-paid internship, but it is like the coolest thing you've ever wanted to do because you're going to get to go to Central America and run around in the rainforest and study animals and do things you've always dreamt of, then go do it. I, like I told you, explore, go do it. Just you just may have it's a give and take thing, right? But otherwise, I would say you know um, you, you'd want a paid internship. Good question. So yeah. And we can other... elaborate on this. We can... <laughs> Any other question for John? Not so much a question as a as a thank you, because I'm looking back on all the things that I've experienced between undergrad and my leadership positions and my internships and jobs with housing. Um, and I this was a really affirming presentation because a lot of the things that I've done that I didn't even realize fit into the scope of GIS um, were showed in the presentation. And I really also have to appreciate uh, a few of the professors in the department, like Dr. Colby and Dr. Maggie Sugg, who have pushed me towards coding. Because uh, in undergrad, I had no concept of how important it is. And now I feel a lot more confident about making my step after grad school. Nice. Nice. And make that shine on your resume, man. Like you can list out all the things that you might have, all the coding languages you've got, but you should also put next to the problem that you solved. I used these coding elements or whatever to actually solve the problem. Don't worry. I, I want to work this out to where I do it, the, what is it, the career development thing in the spring and in the fall with you guys. And I'll be back in the spring. We can do another career development thing and dig into it. Okay. Well, John, I, I you'll have me that, back. If you'll have me back. <laughs> John, we, we have a number of students who are often looking for internships uh, as part of their, their graduate degree requirements. Um, and so, you know, if those sorts of things are available, certainly Dr. Van de Gevel has probably spoken with you about that. But if those sorts of things are available, we would, you know, we would, we would love to circulate that among the students. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make sure I get over to the, the halls of science there soon and we can talk about that. That's great. Thanks for bringing that up. So uh, thank you, John. Uh, let's just give another big applaud for John for his kind of wonderful talk. Thank you, John. My pleasure. My pleasure spending time with you guys today. Absolutely. It's great to all see right. you all today. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. You all have a great one. <laughs>